Okay, hi everyone and welcome to the Prostate Cancer Foundation's webinar, Closing the Great Divide. I'm practicing what we preach on patient-centered care. I'm really honored to host today's webinar. As someone who has watched numerous family members face cancer, we have navigated Australia's healthcare landscape too many times to count. The challenges, the gaps, mental and physical toll of diagnosis and treatment, and the growing out-of-pocket costs for cancer patients is evident. That's why today we are going to explore the concept of patient-centered care. It has clearly become a catch cry for the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare when they released a proposed framework that identified patient-focused care as the first of three dimensions required for a safe and high-quality health system. Since then, healthcare providers continue to struggle to deliver on the promise of affordable, equitable, timely and consistent care for all Australians. I'm the host for this webinar. My name is Crystal Barter. A little bit about me. I'm a mum to three teenagers, one of whom might pop in because it's still school holidays, the CEO of Humanized Health and the founder of Pink Hope. But what has defined so much of my life is my family's cancer history. Over four generations, many in my family have faced cancer as young as 36. And I carry a gene mutation called BRCA1. It puts a carrier at risk of breast, ovarian, prostate, and other cancers. I had a preventative mastectomy at 25 and ovarian surgery at 31. I know how privileged getting access to genetic testing for prevention is. It's something I devote my life to. We still have a long way to go. Now, I'm so honored to introduce our three panelists. I'll only do a brief introduction as I want to give the platform to them as quickly as possible. So Matthew Britland, president of APA. Matt is the president of the Australian Pharmaceutical Medical and Scientific Professionals Association, APA, which is the representative association for medical affairs in Australia and is dedicated to promoting excellence in pharmaceutical medicine through professional development, networking and advocacy. We're also joined by Will McDonald, Nine News presenter, reporter and producer. Will joined Nine News in 2004, working as a reporter and producer. In 2010, he started presenting the 6pm weekend bulletin for Nine News and now the afternoon weekday news. Outside of work, Will has a love of adventure and nature. At only 42, Will was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer completely out of the blue. We're also joined by Tim Baker, author, journalist and surfer. Tim is an award-winning author, journalist and storyteller, specialising in surf history and culture, working across a wide variety of media from books and magazines to film, video and theatre. Tim was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer in 2015. His latest book, Patting the Shark, also documents his cancer journey and will be published in August. Now let's get started. We know about all of the panelists professionally from the intro, but I have an individual question for each of you. So Maddie, you're up first. Tell us about your background in the healthcare industry. You used to be a clinical oncology nurse at the beginning of your career. That's right, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, that was in 1999. Um, I started the Christie Hospital in the UK, which is a big cancer centre. There was 206 beds and I found myself in um, a hematoncology unit. Largely, we were working in stem cell transplantation at that time, Crystal, and that's where, that's where my introduction, I mean, to cancer was, apart from all the personal introductions we always have um, as human beings with this disease. So, yeah, and, and look, I, I loved it. I really, I found myself at the bedside of, you know, tens, hundreds of patients with different cancers, and I found myself questioning what I could do on a, a level up, because I used to individually treat patients, we used to treat patients as they came in and, and let them go again. But at that time in 1999, we're also seeing this kind of real growth in, in the way we understood cancer and, at a genomic level. And that really changed the way that we're thinking about drug development. And I, and I became obsessed with drug development and medicine. And so I retrained in drug development and pharmaceutical medicine, because I thought maybe I can actually do things that you know as I mentioned that level above where rather than just treat, impacting that one patient that comes in each time 
I could do it in hundreds of patients or thousands of patients. And I'm incredibly proud to work within pharmaceutical medicine. It's to me, I mean, it, it's been the biggest thing that has changed um, patients' outcomes. And so here I am now, sat as the, I'm, I'm a medical director at Amgen. And again, very proud. I love what I do. I'm obsessed with what I do, but we just need to do it better. So, Will, uh, you talk about your love for adventure and exploring. What is your most memorable moment? Um, on a personal scale, I think it was the first time I went to Nepal hiking in the Himalayas. Um, and it, it was quite an amazing experience to actually sit and walk and be there and, and, and see this this landscape that you've seen so many times. Um, but to be honest with you, I don't think I really soaked it all in. I didn't I didn't really capture it the way I should have. Um, uh, so I went back a couple of years later and did another trek through uh, parts of Nepal and climbed Mirror Peak, which is I think about six and a half thousand meters. Um, that was that was probably one of the great adventures that I've been on, and I specifically designed it so it was just me uh, with my guide and a porter, and we kind of got off the beaten track, which is hard to do in Nepal now. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the greatest uh, adventure that I think I've had. Um, uh, Nepal is is a place that I strive to get back to. I haven't been there since before I was diagnosed with cancer, and there's certainly a, a, a a real goal to get back and and trek the Himalayas again. Okay, Tim, you're up next. Um, you're such an iconic identity in the surf culture of Australia. I'm probably asking this for lots of many people, lots and lots of people. Take us to your favourite surfing destination. Where is it and why? Yeah, I think it's probably all things considered a wave called Lance's Rights, um, which is uh, in the Mentawai Islands off the west coast of Sumatra. And it's named after a salty old sea skipper from Newcastle named Lance Knight, who um, it's a bit like a country music song. He lost his job. He lost his girlfriend. And I suspect his dog may have died. And he decided that he was going to go to Indonesia and search for surf, as you do. And there's a fantastic story about him jumping in a canoe, little dugout canoe with a local fisherman, not being able to speak a word of Bahasa, Indonesian, and with sign language managing to communicate and um, then getting caught in a storm and just going, the, the fisherman took him through a keyhole in the reef to get out of the storm and he found himself just looking into the eye of this perfect wave. It's about 30 years ago and it's now, you know, a household name and surfers travel from all over the world to go there. It's off a little village called Katiet and it's just, yeah, really stunning location and an incredible wave. Wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, okay. So Tim and Will, obviously um, you were both young when diagnosed with prostate cancer and mm. predominantly came out of the blue. Um, I'm going to ask you both to take us back to those early days of your diagnosis. We might start with you, Will. Yeah, so I had absolutely no symptoms of prostate cancer. Uh, there was nothing to indicate that I would have had that disease specifically. What I did have was uh, my left hip joint was increasingly sore. It, it, it started in a gym one day and it slowly got worse and worse. It was started with a niggling injury and then it kind of got more and more chronic to the point where I think six weeks later I was at a permanent limp because my hip would just, the hip joint on my left side would just not get better no matter what I did. Um, uh, and there's a moment where I describe my story as where skydiving saved my life because I, I do skydive as well um, and I did four jumps on a Friday in July, 2020. And at the end of those four jumps, my hip wasn't just hurting. I wasn't just limping. It was, it was serious, serious pain and it didn't make sense. And I couldn't understand it because I didn't do anything wrong. So at that point I knew I needed to step up the medical test to figure out what was going on. Um, and I was devastated when I thought it was going to be something like early onset arthritis. And then the MRI came back and it was glowing white spots of, you know, cancer through my, my hip joint and pelvis. Um, I, think the, I think the weirdest part of that time 
was when I was first diagnosed is that they didn't know what cancer it was. All we had was the you know telltale white spots on the MRI, which were most likely cancerous lesions. Um, thankfully, medical technology means a blood test quickly discovered my PSA was uh, at 38 and yeah it all went uh, pretty quickly from there to get a biopsy and then pretty rapidly into um, the treatment. Tim can you take us back to those early days as well of your diagnosis? Yeah it's not a dissimilar story to Will's um, I mean I, I was a bit older I'd recently turned 50 um, I'd been getting some pain in my right thigh, which I couldn't find an explanation for. And it would just sort of come and go. I didn't give it too much thought, but um, I was also just getting up during the night a bit more often, which I thought was just what happened as you got older as a bloke, um, but thought I'll go to my GP and have the post 50 checkup. Um, yeah. And that quickly raised some alarm bells. Um, my PSA was 120 on diagnosis. Um, yeah, then all the regular tests, scans, um, biopsy. There was a Gleason score of nine with um, lesions in my right femur and my left rib. And then, yeah, again, quickly moved on to uh, hormone therapy and concurrent chemotherapy. And that was seven years ago. What are some of the greatest challenges you've faced in your experience so far? Um, let's start, Will. Yeah, I, I think um, the greatest thing being pretty young for a, a prostate cancer diagnosis, I think age was the biggest factor in terms of getting information because my, um, my urologist was quite, quite honest and, you know, I talked about how the side effects of chemo and stuff like that. Um, and he said, look, we think you'll do fine because you're young and fit and strong. And he said, to honestly, we've never really treated anyone like you, or at least he hadn't. So kind of kind of summed up that scenario is that, that there's not, for me, uh, as a 42 year old, there's not a lot of things you can base your experience on. You can't go looking for stuff because it's all so different. That was that was the one thing that, that kind of immediately stood out. Um, from a prostate cancer scenario uh, was I didn't have anyone to relate this to. Luckily through the community of the PCFA, I now do have people like Tim and I were, were not that many years apart in terms of diagnosis and such similarities of diagnosis. So, so we do exist. There's not a lot of us in that sort of younger bracket, but uh, we're certainly there. Um, that was the big thing, I reckon, is just that feeling like you were alone and not really being able to bounce off people or at least have a similar experience to anyone. What about you, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I can I can relate to that. I mean, I was a bit older, but I can remember getting given a Cancer Council brochure on prostate cancer and it had a line in it like um, something about, you know, get the most out of life by playing with your grandchildren. And my children were nine and 13 at the time. So, you know, hopefully grandchildren are a fair way off. Um, but for me, the biggest challenge far and away has been the impacts of hormone therapy. Um, that I've found that really um, devastating on multiple fronts. Um, you know, there are obvious side effects from sort of collapsing or blocking a man's testosterone, which I probably don't need to spell out, or I can. <laughs> but um, yeah, I suffered really acute depression along with, um, you know, the loss of sexual function and libido and um even yeah things like cognitive function i found i got kind of really forgetful and um had trouble keeping track of appointments and things like that which was not ideal when you're navigating the medical system um yeah so the hormone therapy for me has been a real real struggle and fortunately i've been able to use it intermittently which has given some relief and i think that's a large part of why i've sort of fared as well as i have what about the impact on your families? Um, you know, because I know, Will, for yourself, your dad had prostate cancer, correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He also had a Gleason 9 score. Uh, he was only six months before me. It was December 2019, I reckon, when he got his official diagnosis. Um, but 
as the uh, luckily he was one of those fellows who goes to the doctor a lot and they caught it relatively early for a really aggressive cancer so he went through the the process of a uh, his prostate being removed and now I think his PSA is undetectable which is good news so well, I think the impact of that was that when I first was diagnosed and was going through the horrible processes of telling your uh, your parents what's going on um, I couldn't for lack of a better term bullshit them about anything because <laughs> they knew all the details I couldn't sugarcoat it I couldn't go through and say hey, it'll be fine so I had to pretty much go in there with you know both barrels and say well I've got it too but mine's much worse um the impact on my family i think look we've dealt with it really well uh to be honest and i'll be uh, i guess from my scenario without gravity on too much um i went into the whole process pretty quickly with this um white hot positivity um and i was determined it was annoyingly positive i, I kind of describe it as <laughs> and I kind of made everyone get on board with it. Uh, so that's how we dealt with it. And the other the other way that I think that, is, that has helped my family as well, especially my partner, Samantha, um, obvious challenges of hormone therapy, which I'm also on as well. Um, but we just deal with it completely honestly and not hide anything and not pretend that everything's, you know, rosy and perfect all the time. But we also laugh as well, and we also joke about things that you know aren't particularly funny, but they are. <laughs> but they are when you've got, to, but they are when you've got to live them every yeah. day. And if you don't, Tim's probably laughing at the same things that we probably laugh about. And um, if you don't laugh about them, I don't know. You you, you just go mad, and I and I uh, and I just want to live the best life I can with what I've got. Mm. What about for you, Tim? Yeah, I think that again, that's probably been one of the hardest things is the the impact on my family because um, because of my sort of mental health challenges, um, I'm acutely aware of the way my sort of mood swings and stuff have impacted my wife and kids. And we just recently, I've got a 16 year old son now who has just recently been diagnosed with ADHD, and that combination of a father on hormone therapy and a son with ADHD, I can tell you is not a great combination. You know, my, my wife has often said it feels like she has two teenagers on her hands because our prefrontal cortexes are similarly dysfunctional. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, I mean, we've just tried to, yeah, like we'll have really good, honest communication and have some of the difficult conversations um, but yeah, for me, there's, there's no, I think there's a bit of guilt and shame around that. Just there's, there just hasn't seemed to be a way to really effectively mitigate those impacts. And, you know, I, I, I carry that and I, you know, do the best I can, but I'm acutely aware of the fact that it's, you know, it has impacted them and, um, we just, you know, we, we soldier on and we enjoy the good times and, you know, comfort each other through the tough times. Well, one last question for this round, but what is something that you should have had access to, but you didn't? Um, I'll go if you like. I've got a pretty simple one um, that I think is, is highly critical for me was um, I probably didn't get all the info and a bone density scan. Um, that was one of the things that I've now, you know, two years on have discovered that um, a bone density scan was pretty critical. Luckily, I picked up that bit of information earlier this year and went along and got the bone density scan because obviously hormone therapy very quickly puts you at risk of osteoporosis. And uh, my lumbar spine is, um, is was getting very close to the rating of being of having osteoporosis through it which is not great for a you know 44 year old um so i think that was one of the pieces of information honestly that that i i did miss um and whether it was my fault or no it's no one's fault really it's just the way it works it's just trying to make things better for the future for people that's all mm. and tim yeah i look i discovered I think it was about four years after my diagnosis, my GP clinic contacted me and told me that I qualified for something called a care plan as someone with a chronic illness that entitled me to, I think it's five 
referrals a year to allied health professionals. And if that had been triggered upon diagnosis, I would have loved to have been referred to an exercise physiologist, a nutritionist, a psychologist, uh, perhaps a men's sexual health therapist. Um, and look, there's a whole range of other um, allied health professionals that you can use those referrals for. Um, and it just seemed to be, it seems like it could be a fairly easy, easy fix in the system for that to be triggered by your diagnosis. Because we just went through it sort of, I guess a process of trial and error, sort of assembling a team and what were the most useful sort of supportive therapies that were going to help me manage my diagnosis and mitigate side effects. But a lot of that trial and error, yeah, could have been eliminated with a fairly simple um, sort of information sheet and, uh, um, you know, that, that care plan being triggered, as I say, by the diagnosis. Now, we haven't forgotten about you, Manny. I've got a couple of burning questions for you. So, um, you know, we know each other personally and professionally, and I know that you have had a, an extensive kind of personal experience in regards to cancer in your family. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, cancer is back now one in two people. So this is the thing that unites us all. Tim and Will have lived it firsthand, but with all, all of us, everybody I know has been impacted by this, right? And we, 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 we think about cancer, when I look at it and I look at the data, I look at Kaplan Meier curves and survival, you forget about the impact, the, the huge cascade. I've lost people, you know, mates in the thirties, grandparents in the nineties, and it all makes me a little bit angry. Um, it all makes me, always makes me a little bit, it, it feeds my motivation. But all, and I think about every patient I've ever met. And I, th I think about what Will said then about, you know, his dad getting it early because he had a, a good literacy with the GP and frequency with the GP. And this is one of the things that really gets me up in the morning, Crystal, is that every cancer starts as stage one. No cancer starts as stage four. Every cancer starts as one cell that turns into two, into four and eight. And in some cancers, that happens about as quickly as I'm seeing. It. And so we've got a really good opportunity if, if, we, if we come together to make sure that we get these things diagnosed earlier because a lot of the people that I've lost in my life probably would still be here if we'd have diagnosed them sooner. And so it, it's driven completely about people and patients. That's literally why I get up in the morning and it unites us all, right? And that's a shame. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll... And, and Tim, I mean, you, you've, you've got cancer, but you also must have lost people from cancer, right? And how does that impact you, having experienced losing people, but then having it? Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like the club that no one wants to join, you know? And uh, I went along to a couple of um, retreats at a place called the Gawler Foundation in Victoria that was founded by Ian Gawler. And I met a couple of people who just made a huge impact on me. And, you know, I was only with them for five days at this retreat. There was one in particular, Ben, who was a beautiful young guy who ran community choirs. Um, he'd, he'd recently come out as gay to his parents. He lived just long enough um, for the marriage equality bill to be passed and to marry his partner about a month before he died. And I happened to be in Melbourne on the day of his funeral. And it was, you know, this guy that I'd only known for five days and it just completely devastated me. You know, I, I didn't know his family. I didn't know anyone else in his world. And I was sitting up the back of this church and I, I emailed his partner later and said, look, I'm sorry, I didn't hang around. I had to get to the airport, but I thought your friends must've been wondering who this bloke was who came in, sat up the back and just bawled his eyes out and then just bolted for the door straight after, because I just, yeah, I, it was really just a bit too close to home. We do have a question in the panel, but Will, I'd love to ask you the same question. Yeah, um, look, I, I tell you what, I can, you talk about the guilt that Tim talked about a little bit earlier. Um, my partner, Samantha, she lost her mother to cancer when she was um, 17. So um, I guess, when I was diagnosed and then I thought, oh God, this poor woman, you know, this wonderful woman who's, you know, 
stuck by my side is now going through it with her, you know, for lack of a better term, husband, even though we're not married. Um, now she's she's going through that kind of diagnosis again. So you just or there isn't there isn't a moment when you kind of don't think about like there's not a moment when I don't think about poor my, my partner Samantha and the loss of her mother um, at 17, and they were so close, and she basically nursed her for the last few months of her life. So just to to see someone have to go through that um, and mm. then, you know, and then end up with, with this scenario where I'm, uh, you know, doing well, but still with, with a, you know, cancer diagnosis hanging above us. It's, it's quite, it's quite difficult to deal with at times. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's that moment when you, you never forget what has, what has happened to, to others before you and you know, you're not alone and you know, that well, I guess we're here to try and make sure less people go through such horrible circumstances. I'm back. Everyone can hear me, right? Gotta love technology yep. and Northern Beaches <laughs> Wi-Fi. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really wanted to explore, and this is kind of a, uh, I guess from my standpoint, my family has navigated the healthcare system in Australia quite extensively. Um, and we talk so much about patient-centred care, as in it's this mantra that everyone talks about that is the focus. Um, are we living up to it? Is the healthcare system in Australia living up to that mantra? Do you want to go first, Will? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or do you want to go? <laughs> um, I, I might not stop, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, you go, you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, yeah, look, I, I, I would say no, we're not. Um, I was shocked by the degree to which I was unprepared for the sort of side effects of treatment and the lack of sort of supportive therapies or even information on how to mitigate some of those impacts. Um, yeah, I mentioned the care plan would have been a huge help from the outset. Um, I struggle, I think, with a lot of um, elements of mainstream oncology while being incredibly grateful for modern medicine that has kept me alive this long. Um, you know, a lot of oncologists, I think, um, they're so focused on what they do and they've got to be across so much information. I don't think they have the emotional bandwidth for that kind of support um, or, or even knowledge of things like, you know, diet and exercise and um things that could make a difference and so there is a need for a real interdisciplinary team which in my experience just hasn't happened you know we've we've had to assemble a team of our own over time and through trial and error as I said um, and yeah so that lack of coordination I think those sort of gaps in the sort of treatment plan it, it just doesn't have to be that way I think uh, you know obviously these things aren't as simple as you know, just clicking your fingers. Um, but yeah, I'd certainly be up for helping <laughs> advocate for some of the changes that might improve. Like a Those... standard of care plan. Every patient should have access to that, right? Yeah. And I mean, every man with prostate cancer should be um, referred to an exercise physiologist. You know, the, the, um, the research and the evidence around exercise is phenomenal. It, it addresses so many of the side effects of treatment. And the, the, the time I've spent with um, exercise physiologists or physiotherapists, I've participated in a couple of studies and they've just been fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure I'm tracking as well as I am seven years on and I'm still surfing because of the, um, the benefits of exercise in particular. But that whole sort of um, holistic, integrative approach, exercise, meditation, diet, um, all those kinds of things are, are really valuable. And I think they should just be inside the oncology tent um, rather than anything complementary or alternative being regarded with suspicion as sort of dubious. And, and if we embrace those things, then the things that are dubious and are just, you know, snake oil would kind of be left exposed when we bring the evidence-based complementary therapies kind of within the oncology tent. Mm. What about you, Will? Um, yeah, actually the first I've heard of this 
care plan thing is from Tim today. Um, so, I, so I didn't have one either, but I was one of those people too who um, basically, like I said, I was extraordinarily positive, but that also meant that I knew I had to work hard to do things. Um, I think I fared very fortunately, but I think it has been in some ways just pure luck in that I've had a GP who is terrific um, and I got referred to a, a great urologist who who has been really good and my oncologist as well. So I, I know I'm fortunate in this little circumstance and I'm fortunate in so many ways of having to deal with a serious cancer diagnosis in the, the situation I am. Um, you know, but I know that that's not the experience of everyone. Uh, I just know it because I hear it and I talk to people about it. And and th there should be, there's always going to be slight deviations from the average, but the average should be the norm. It shouldn't be someone had a great experience, someone had a terrible experience, someone had a great experience, someone had a terrible. There should be just at least a way of making sure everyone gets the, the, the a, a good service, a good set of information so you don't hear the horror stories um, and I feel like I, I'm I'm lucky because of a the position I'm in here in Adelaide I, I know lots of people just purely through my job and I'm not scared to ask questions because I've done it for 22 years um, so I think that makes a huge difference so you want to make sure people get empowered I guess to make sure that they know they can ask questions if they don't Mm. like like the answer um but yeah but, but, so no the, the standard care for everyone is not is not the same uh, i guess that's the yeah. goal yeah um maddie we'll get you a chance to this question then we're going to jump into some of the community q and a's that have come through so go maddie yeah okay so i mean we're so far off this proper patient engagement the word patient centricity is kind of we've established it's a very overused word um, and I think but, but the patient's voice is getting a lot louder and it's getting a lot more informed. Uh, and, and we need to we need to we need to get the patient voice elevated as well. I mean, well, everybody on this call knows now prostate cancer is the most common cause of cancer diagnosed in Australia. Um, and there's still, you know, we're getting we're developing these medicines and we, we really are accelerating science. But it all is futile unless patients can actually get access to these medicines. And that's where this patient voice comes in because there's still a big lag between when TGA approves something for use and PBS actually reimburses it's about 820 days in Australia, it's two years. That's a long time for anybody with cancer, but also the voice of the patient, I think is becoming so much more important. And that, that process is called HTA, Health Technology Assessment. It's just how we figure out what gets reimbursed and what doesn't. But I think patients have got a really good opportunity to actually say, look, this is what it's like with this disease. If we don't get that information from clinical trials. We don't get it from patient reported outcomes in clinical trials. We don't get that patient voice. And I think the patient voice needs to get so loud in the ears of government, particularly now as the HTA is being reformed. And then I think we'll start getting some steps to achieve from what you've just mentioned, um, Crystal, but we're a long way off. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to get to a couple of the Q and A questions. So great to hear Tim and Will share their story. I know a lot of men in my support group who have had similar experiences. Interested to know whether, knowing what they now know, what they would do differently, if anything. So Tim, do you want to go first? Yeah. Well, wow, that's a that's a tough one because. Um... Yeah, you know, I've struck, as I said, I've struggled with um, some of the medications and um, what has been the saving grace for me is that intermittent hormone therapy. And that took quite a while for me to, I guess, become aware of and to convince my oncologist that that was an option. I mean, I'd got to the point where I was almost suicidally depressed when I said, I just, I can't take this drug anymore. and um, and the, this, this was early in the COVID pandemic and I, I had a break from hormone therapy, which was a real a saving grace. And then the decision, the PS, my PSA started rising again. And the, the choice was to go back on hormone therapy or to have more chemotherapy in the midst of a pandemic when being immunocompromised um, wasn't a great idea. And so, you know, I did have to go back on hormone therapy but I think, yeah, being able to, um, particularly for younger men, I think there's a, 
you know, there hasn't been much of a change in the protocols for prostate cancer in recognition of this younger subset of men. And if there was a recognition that in some instances that intermittent hormone therapy could be applicable for men who are highly motivated, really fit and healthy, prepared to work hard to look after their health, and then just get that holiday from hormone therapy intermittently has really made my life, um, yeah, bearable, really. What about you, Will? Um, I don't know what I'd, it's, as Tim said, this is a really hard question because I don't know what I'd do differently because I'm still here. Um, I'm still alive. I'm still going all right. Uh, so, so I don't really know, to be honest with you. That's, it's such a, it's such a great question that it's completely stumped me because when I first started, and I'm only a couple of years into my journey, Tim's probably, um, the journey is a terrible word, but it's what we use. I'm only a couple of years on from my diagnosis. Um, and so I suppose I've got a bit more to go through and experience and think about, but um, I'm just, you know, I've got to the point where I'm so happy to be relatively, well, I am healthy, fit, going going okay. Um, so I don't really have any answer. There's a long-winded answer to say, I don't think I'd do anything differently. I've, I've thought of a couple of others that I, I can- <laughs> You can fill in the gaps. <laughs> well, I just thought as you were speaking, um, one is I would go and see a men's sexual health therapist really early on because I went, I went and saw one about four years post-diagnosis and he said, this is a really common scenario. You know, men are so kind of focused on survival in the first few years of their diagnosis. They don't really pay attention to things like sexual function, but if you deal with it early, there are ways to improve that and to sort of lessen the impacts of hormone therapy. So that is something I would definitely do. Um, and I would also be more mindful of the impacts on my family. I think when you get that diagnosis, you can tend to really go within. And, you know, you feel like, well, in my case, I'm sure, Will, it's similar for you. You kind of feel like you're doing it for your family. You know, you're being careful about what you eat. You're exercising. In my case, I was meditating a couple of hours a day. I just was on this complete mission to just, you know, stay healthy for as long as possible. And, but in doing so, I think I sort of became a bit isolated or a little bit unaware of the way my diagnosis was impacting my family. And I think that is something I would definitely do differently and just be much more sensitive and conscious of how they were traveling as well as I, how I, I was traveling. We're getting so many questions coming through, so I don't think we'll be able to do all of them this time around. Mm. But um, another one, um, which is for the whole panel, awesome hearing all of you speak. How do we get more men to speak up? So many men won't talk about it. Seems like the way we handle breast versus prostate cancer is totally different. Maddie, do you want to start this one? I, I, I've got a 15-year-old son, right? And, and, I, and I think I'm going to be, and what I've tried to do with him is, is try and get him to speak up and try and talk to him about prostate cancer and sex and other things like that. So I think as, as parents, we've got an opportunity to actually, uh, you know, empower the next generation to speak up more, but that's, that's going to be some time away, late, you know, a bit late. And I just think we need to start talking at the pub about it. Do you know what I mean? Like men's health. And, and, and start raising profiles and doing things. I mean, you know, I think it's great we do November and other things like that, but I just think there's a lot more we can do. And it's just all about talking. And it's just all about breaking down these barriers uh, and, and the, you know, the fear and the guilt. I think that'll all be diffused if we just start talking about it. Just yeah, 100%, I'd, I'd completely endorse that. You know, I think women are much better at talking about some of this stuff. And, you know, Crystal, in your own case, you know, women can be really, you know, brave about discussing things like mastectomies. But, mm. you know, when I was diagnosed, I was just completely shocked to discover that the frontline treatment for the most common cancer in men was effectively chemical castration. Mm -hmm. Like I had no idea that that was a considered a viable yeah. medical treatment and it completely sideswiped me. And in all the support groups and forums I've been in, men are very coy about discussing the impacts of that on their sexuality, their masculinity, their lives. And I just made the decision in, in writing this book and, and just in my conversations, just as uncomfortable as it is, I just think it needs 
to be dragged out into the light and we need to talk about it. And, um, you know, it, yeah, it's not a comfortable thing, um, but it, yeah, men have got to get much better at discussing this stuff. What about you, Will? Yeah, I, I want to pick up on what Tim said there is that the only reason I don't get more frank and brutal about some of the things I've gone through and some of the things you can avoid if you get tested early is because I get worried about offending people to a large extent. They're going to, they're going to get uncomfortable about, oh my God, what, oh, this is just reality for lots of people. Um, but more to the point, I think I wish I could sometimes get really frank and honest and, and brutal about what's going on because I think that would motivate you to go to the doctor a bit more and make sure you take care of your health in so many ways a bit more, especially for men, if you knew what was going to happen if you ended up having to go on hormone therapy. Like like Tim said, I had no idea hormone therapy was a thing for prostate cancer until, you know, three days, I got the prescription and three days later I'm on it. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's that need for uh, for men just to, 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 to be even, even more frank um, than they are in many ways and um and and for society not to get offended when they listen when people tell their stories about about what goes on because i think that, that the harsh realities are very harsh and i think if we hear them a bit more um maybe that will shock people into at least looking after themselves better mm. Now, one specifically for you, Maddie. Outstanding to have an advocate like Mr. Britland in a leadership role within the industry and to know there is an appetite for change. Seems like we need much greater action by government to help fund and deliver system change. Do you agree, Maddie? I do. <laughs> I do agree. <laughs> there shouldn't be a day between TGA and PBS. Like, why have we got a gap? We've got a really good system and it's a health technology system and it's great, but we, we need to reduce that gap from 820 days to zero. And, and there's no reason why we can't do that. If we do do that, what will also happen is that companies will invest more in clinical trials, for example. If you're a first launch country within this industry, companies will put more clinical trials. In Australia, out of everybody that can be on a clinical trial, only about 6% get on clinical trials. Most patients don't know what clinical trials are there for them, and, and they're often standard of care. So absolutely agree that the government needs to do more to, to reduce this gap, and they are, with this HTA review, but it really depends on the outputs. And to me, the only KPI I want to see is a zero-day gap between TGA and PBS, and then patients can access the beds medicine um, as soon as possible and, and and the world would be a lot better place for it. <laughs> now one more quick question before we jump back into the others. Um, can the panel comment on the confusing interface between private and the public health system? Like I'm well aware the out-of-pocket costs for patients in both systems can be sky high. Can you talk us through some of the challenges that you face kind of in navigating both the public and private system and, and the costs that patients experience? Um, do you want to start, Will? Um, yes, I can. Uh, look, I didn't do anything through the public system, so I, I, I've only heard that through what the PCFA nurses uh, have told me when I've been blessed enough to meet them and talk to them, and I I'm, I'm find it phenomenal that patients rarely see the same oncologist twice in the public health system from what I've been told. So I, I, I find that quite amazing. Um, the, 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 the private health system probably was, was fine for me and, and good, but the out-of-pocket costs were still extraordinary in, in many cases. Um, I think my radiotherapy was out-of-pocket cost of six grand. I've had two PSMA PET scans at about $900 each. Um, I've had genetic testing done um, uh, early on, which was, I think, a four grand straight outlay. Um, so they're, and they're, they're just the major ones I can think about. All the time, there's something else. There's this, another scan, an MRI or something or something or something. Um, so the out-of-pocket costs are quite, you know, extreme in many cases. Um, and I've been fortunate that I can cover them, but it still hurts. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, that's my experience in the private system. Uh, it, it served me well, but there's still an ongoing bill, even though you think you pay your private health insurance.
there's still something extra all the time. Yeah. What about you, Tim? Yeah, I go along with that. I mean, again, I've I've mainly dealt with the, the private system. We were lucky enough to have health insurance. So I don't have a great deal of experience with the public system, but I've heard similar things to Will. Um, but yeah, those out, out of pocket expenses, just they just kind of ambush you because it's never spelled out anywhere, you know, what's covered and what isn't. And so you just discover these expenses along the way. And it's incredibly difficult to you know, manage your finances or plan ahead because you just, you never know what's covered and what isn't. Um, at one stage, I was on a, a disability support pension because I just was incapable of working. And the, I mean, this is a bit of a different question, but, you know, dealing with Centrelink was pretty dispiriting. And then I remember at one point I was waiting to get a PSMA PET scan, which here on the Gold Coast, I think it was costing me $700. And in the waiting room, I received a notification from Centrelink telling me my disability support pension had been cancelled because I hadn't filled in a particular form on time. And I thought, here I am sitting in a radiologist waiting room, waiting to see if my cancer has spread. But fortunately, good old Centrelink are awake to the uh, possibility that I'm a welfare cheat, you know. But yeah, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty miserable kind of situation. The amount of comments that, and um, questions that are coming through mm. is a lot. It just shows how much people, how many questions they have. Mm. Um, we just can't get to all of them. But I, it's just a comment that I think kind of sums it up. Is mm. um, As well as not getting offended, society need to make light of the side effects of diagnosis and treatments. It's time to acknowledge the impacts on men so we can support them better. Mm. Um, obviously, PCFA um, and the support both from a mental health perspective, from a nurse perspective, um, and there's lots of support groups out there. Um, is there anything else from a support perspective that you've seen that um, has really helped you? Oh, look, there's a fantastic book called Facing the Tiger by Professor Susan Chambers, which every man should be given upon diagnosis. It's a, it's a really great resource and I wish I'd had it from day one. Uh, and yeah, I mean, people like Susan, Professor Chambers are just doing wonderful work and they just, yeah, there needs to be more awareness of that psychological dimension for sure. But um, that's a great starting point, um, Facing the Tiger. What about you, Will? Anything? Um, I think the, 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 the greatest thing of supporting men is that conversation you can have one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I know from my scenario here in Adelaide, um, lots of people know I've got prostate cancer, um, and people do come up to me and will talk about their scenarios. I had a chat with a, an acquaintance not long ago, and this is a scenario that I would have never imagined because I didn't have my prostate removed. But this, this chap did, and he was telling me about how he was incontinent at that point and the shame and embarrassment of going to the bathroom and wearing a um, incontinence pad but there was no bin in the bathroom mm. so he didn't know what to do with it um he didn't there was there was no ability to get rid of the incontinence pad that he'd just used um and that's something that I, I think we need to pick up on and we can obviously probably make some, some moves forward so that organizations and, and you know all sorts of companies know that a sanitary bin in the main men's bathroom might really help someone's mental health in that moment. Um, mm. But I, I really think sharing uh, with another with another man going through the same thing can can really help people um, uh, get through some of the most difficult scenarios. Um, but it does take a bit of a bit of bravery to kind of open yourself up. I know that I've been through that. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, you get to the point where you just know it's going to do more good than harm. Yeah, wow. Um, Manny, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I just want to talk about the role of um, specialist nurses a little bit, because all of the questions I see down in this panel, mm -hmm. all think about interface between private and public. If you've got a really good prostate cancer specialist nurse holding your hand through the whole way, um, I just... I just, I can't, I can't believe people, everybody doesn't have that. And I think we need to make sure that happens because a lot of this stuff 
um, I think can be done by really empowering this amazing group of professionals. So it's not really, <laughs> it's just a comment, but I, yeah. I'd love to throw that out there. Absolutely. Um, we're going to start slowly wrapping up over the next few minutes. Um, but I just want you all to give the audience what's the final message that you all want to leave with them? Um, Tim, we'll start with you. Yeah, oh, look, I just had a quick scan of the questions. So I hope I can try and um, address a few of them at once. Mm -hmm. um, someone was asking about sort of complementary therapies. My, my personal sort of self-care mantra has become um, just remember to take your meds, M-E-D-S, which stands for meditation, exercise, diet and sleep. And they've become the sort of four pillars of my self-care. So I just, I try and tick each one of those boxes every day. I do my morning and evening meditation. I try and do some sort of intense exercise every day. Try and eat lots of vegetables. You know, I, I don't go in for any particular diet, you know, whether it be ketogenic or vegan or whatever it might be. I just think Michael Pollan said it best, um, eat food, mainly plants, not too much. Um, so that's my best that. dietary advice. <laughs> Okay, Will, you're next. Um, I guess firstly, I would say there are always questions that I wish I'd asked. There's not a huge amount, but there were questions that I wish I'd asked before I needed to, to ask them and not wait too long. So if you're not sure about something, if you don't know what's going on, get to the bottom of it. Ask as many questions as you need to of your doctor, specialists, or the PCFA nurses who, who have helped me when I've just bumped into mm. them at events. They've been wonderful at just easing the fears that you might crop up in the middle of the night. Don't ruminate on questions that you're not sure the answers. Um, please don't. Um, and, and just, I guess the, the thing that I've found hugely cathartic and in many ways of dealing with a really difficult scenario is having a support team there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't even know these, this support team. Often they're complete strangers, um, you know, on the Facebook groups with the PCFA uh, and stuff like that. But never, never be scared, I guess, to reach out for support and love and kindness because I know it comes back in, in buckets when you find the right people and you talk mm -hmm. to the right people. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be one of my things. Never be scared to reach out for that help uh, and support. And can I just quickly mention the PCFA website as a resource? I mean, there's the online community forum, there's telehealth, prostate cancer nurses, and there's now also a counselling service. Yeah, for mental all, health, yeah. All of which I've availed myself of, and they're fantastic services, and they're free, and they address so many needs for men. So, yeah, I'd say dive in and make use of those services. Um, and if I can quickly also just plug something else, which is really uh, important to me and Tim as well. If I just do this, the PCFA team um, <laughs> on my T-shirt. It's a wonderful fundraising source. I'm never, I'm never lack of inspiration when I jump onto the uh, to the site that the PCFA runs um, and just see what amazing people are doing out there. So, thank you to everyone who's uh, anyway shape involved in uh, working towards finding a, a cure and, and funding more support. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. And last words from you, Maddie. I think, I mean, I started by saying the patient's voice is just like everything. We want to hear from people. We want to hear as a pharmaceutical medical development industry. We want to hear for pay, from patients. The government want to hear from patients. And even if we don't, we need to make sure they do. Um, if you, your voice is there, and please use it. And, and please know it, it, it's so important to us. Nothing, nothing we do is it means any, nothing means anything unless we get this right patients in Australia. Um, and let's start with a big disease like prostate cancer. Why not? Well, thank you, everyone. That's a wrap. Uh, firstly, we want to thank our panellists for their time. Your experience, your openness and your commitment to changing the outcome for others is profound. It's an absolute honour to chat with you today. Secondly, a big thank you to our sponsor, Amgen. This would not have been possible without you. And a final message for our audience, if you need support, have any questions or require resources, please call the Prostate Cancer Foundation on 1800 
0099 or visit pcfa.org.au. Thank you everyone for your time. And there's my dog barking for the finale. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.